Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening and warm welcome to one and all to the 12th R.K. Talwar Memorial Lecture. I am Soumya from IABF and your host for today's evening. I now request Mr. Biswaketan Das, CEO IABF, to kindly escort Mr. M. Rajeshwar Rao, Deputy Governor, RBI, and Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara, Chairman SBI and President IIBF to the dais. Let's welcome them with a round of applause. Let's have the floor roaring. I now request Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara, Chairman SBI and President IIBF, to welcome Mr. Rajeshwar Rao, Deputy Governor, Reserve Bank of India, with a bouquet of flowers and preside over the function. I now request Mr. Biswaketan Das, CEO IIBF, to welcome Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara, Chairman SBI and President IIBF, with a bouquet of flowers. I now request Dr. S. Murlidharan, Director Academics, IIBF, and Mr. Francis, Director Operations, to welcome the MDs, Mr. C.S. Shetty, Mr. J.S. Swaminathan, Mr. Ashwini Kumar Tiwari, and Mr. Alok Kumar Chaudhary with a bouquet of flowers. Today, we also have in our midst Mr. Karan Talwar, direct descendant and grandson of Sri Rajkumar Talwar, attending the lecture. Request Mr. Francis to welcome Mr. Karan Talwar with a bouquet of flowers. We shall now commence with the event. Ladies and gentlemen, a humble request, kindly keep your mobile phones in silent mode. It does not matter the number of years that one lives. What matters is the quality and contribution made to life in the number of years that you have lived. This is indeed very appropriate to Sri Rajkumar Talwar as we celebrate his birth centenary along with 75 years of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. I think there definitely needs a <laughs> applause. A few words about Sri Rajkumar Talwar. Sri Rajkumar Talwar was born on June 3rd, 1922, 
He joined the Imperial Bank of India at Lahore in November 1943 as a probationary assistant and went on to become the youngest chairman of SBI during 1969 to 76. He was also the president, the vice president, and the governing council member of the Indian Institute of Banking and Finance, formerly known as the Indian Institute of Bankers. He contributed immensely to the growth of IIBF. State Bank of India has instituted this annual memorial lecture in memory of Sri R.K. Talwar. The admirers of Sri R.K. Talwar from amongst the pensioners, existing staff of the bank, and some outsiders collected funds to create an endowment to perpetuate his memory and recall his role or contribution in the growth and development of the bank. SBI, on its part, contributed a matching amount, and the same was given to IIBF as the corpus for holding this annual event. The first R.K. Talwar Memorial Lecture was held in 2007, which was delivered by Dr. C. Rangarajan, former governor RBI, on the Indian banking system challenges ahead. Since then, renowned personalities from the banking and finance fraternity have been invited to deliver lectures on contemporary economic and banking topics. So far, we have organized 11 lectures. The last lecture was held virtually by Dr. was held virtually and delivered by Dr. K. Krishnamurti, sorry, by Krishnamurti V. Subramanian, former Chief Economic Advisor, Government of India, on India's COVID response. The lecture delivered by him received an overwhelming response. And now we are happy again to host the event in the physical mode after two years. Today, we have with us Mr. M. Rajeshwar Rao, Deputy Governor, RBI, for delivering the 12th R.K. Talwar Memorial Lecture on a very interesting and contemporary topic, reflecting on policy choices in the Indian financial system. The speech will be followed by a brief question and answer session, after which the birth centenary of Sri Rajkumar Talwar will be celebrated by releasing a compilation of the memorial lectures held from 2007 to 2021. I now request CEO IIBF, Mr. Biswaketan Das, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Somya. Uh, very good afternoon uh, to all the dignitaries present uh, on the dais and uh, of the dais. I, on behalf of Indian Institute of Banking and Finance, welcome all of you to this 12th R.K. Talwar Memorial Lecture. I am thankful to State Bank of India, particularly the uh, team STU, for helping us organize this meeting after uh, two years in a physical mode and in this grand manner. So today, incidentally, is the birth centenary of uh, late Sri R.K. Talwar this year, not exactly today, this year. So the lecture is basically not to remember Sri Talwar per se, but to imbibe some of his uh, qualities, uh, if possible. So the late R.K. Talwar, who was the youngest and most illustrious chairman of SBI, was a leader par excellence, and he believed in the principle, do not follow where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trial. Right? So he, his action created the legacy that inspires all the bankers even uh, today. A strong believer of value-based leadership qualities, Sri Talwar has the vision that stood the test of time. One of his vision is the modular structure still operational in State Bank of India. <laughs> so he was the example of professionalism, not only for SBI, but for the whole banking industry as a whole. So his impeccable integrity and organization first approach still inspires all of us and made him the legend. Today, I am privileged to welcome Sri M. Rajeshwar Rao, Deputy Governor of Reserve Bank of India. Extremely thankful for, to him, sir, for accepting our invitation and the topic chosen by him 
the, for the today's lecture, it is not only contemporary, relevant, but also thought-provoking. I have the pleasure to welcome Sri Dinesh Kumar Khara, Chairman of State Bank of India and also the President of Indian Institute of Banking and uh, Finance, uh, who is the guiding force behind all the activities what IIVF does, including this uh, lecture. I am extremely glad to uh, welcome all the MDs present uh, here uh, to this lecture and uh, those who have been successful in inspiring and instilling a sense of purpose in SBI. I welcome all the DMDs and CGMs uh, to this lecture and I welcome all the MDs of associates and subsidiaries who are uh, present here uh, to this uh, meeting. I welcome all uh, the officers from State Bank of India and officers from other banks also, including the PNB and the Union Bank of India, uh, to this uh, meeting. I welcome on behalf of SBI and on behalf of IIBF, uh, Mr. Karan Talwar, uh, the grand uh, son of uh, Mr. R.K. Talwar, uh, to this meeting, and thankful for uh, coming to you. So, thank you. So, having said that, uh, for a success of any organization, it is necessary to have a visionary and creative leadership. Sri Dinesh Kumar Khara, as the chairman of SBI, has taken the bank uh, to newer heights with his inclusive and transformative leadership qualities. Stock market is supposed to be the best judge for perception and performance of any organization. And seeing the state bank's share price constantly on the rise, we know where the state bank will be in future years. As the president of IIBF, under his able and inspiring guidance, IIBF is aiming to transform itself uh, as the preferred institution for the bankers with contemporary curriculum and value-based program. I now, I now request Sri Dinesh Kumar Khara, the chairman of State Bank and president of IIBF, uh, to say a few words about the lecture. Thank you very much. Very good evening to all of you. It's my proud privilege to welcome Mr. Rao, Mr. Amrajeshwar Rao, to this August lecture series. Uh, rightly mentioned by Mr. Das, this is one of the most respectable lecture series which we have seen more so in the banking fraternity. And rightly mentioned in terms of the contribution of Mr. R.K. Talwar, I think when it comes to history of bank, his name is always remembered. He is known for his radical way in which he led the organization, perhaps in most difficult times too. It has become a landmark event for both SBI and IIBF. Mr. Talwar was the chairman of the bank during 1969 to 76. That was a period when he could earn a high degree of respect among the bankers for his significant contribution in shaping the bank and banking in India. As well as his exemplary leadership qualities, which we now even remember though we were not there in the bank when he demitted the office of chairman. He was a man of principles, principles which have stood the test of time. As a governing council member, vice president and president of IIBF, he has contributed immensely to the growth of the institutions with his vast and rich experience. As a mark of respect, to this great leader, State Bank of India decided to institute an annual lecture series on contemporary topics of the Indian financial system. I am thankful to IIBF for successfully organizing this prestigious lecture series since 2007. It gives me immense pleasure to be part of this 12th R.K. Talwar Memorial Lecture today. We are indeed privileged to have an experienced central banker who is actually leading the way of the banking system at a very, very critical juncture. 
rightly so the topic picked up by him in terms of reflecting on policy choices for indian financial system is perhaps the apt the financial system of any country plays a very very significant role in its economic development by serving as a catalyst by facilitating seamless mobilization of funds and efficient deployment of those funds there has been a paradigm shift in the market disintermediation that has happened in the last decade the indian financial system is on the cusp of change because of the rapid digital transformation and emergence of new players gradually the role of nbfcs fintech companies new bank is gaining currency considering the growth complexity of the financial system emerging in india the policy guidelines from regulators assume much more significant importance rbi as a regulator has been performing an admirable job in ensuring economic growth and maintaining financial stability by effectively monitoring the evolving markets and the related risk a series of measures have been taken by rbi in the recent past the effect of which are visible now in fact due to the proactive steps taken by rbi the banking system has been able to withstand the debilitating effect of the financial crisis on account of the pandemic and geopolitical crisis triggered by russia ukraine war the world of banking of tomorrow and beyond is expected to be more collaborative as well as competitive with new players offering innovative financial products good and proactive governance remains the sine qua non for success of the financial sector today honorable deputy governor will be reflecting on the policy choices for the indian financial system i'm sure the lecture will be enlightening for all of us present here and many learning points for the sector as a whole i thank you all for taking out time and participating in this event and my special thanks to the grandson of mr talwar thank you very much for having come over there thank you thank you sir i now request uh, mr biswaketan das to introduce our speaker mr m rajeshwar rao to the audience uh, the deputy governor uh, mr m rajeshwar rao needs no introduction but uh, having invited here i have the pleasure in introducing with few words sri m rajeshwar rao took over as the deputy governor of reserve bank of india <laughs> on october 9 2020 he was the executive director of reserve bank of india prior to his elevation to the post of deputy governor as deputy governor sri rao will look after department of regulation department of communication enforcement department inspection department legal department and risk monitoring department sri rao a career central banker joined the bank in 1984 and has worked in various positions in reserve bank of india as executive director he was looking after the financial markets operation department the international department the internal debt management department and the secretaries department in rbi prior to taking over as the executive director sri rajeshwar rao was the chief general manager financial markets operation department and has previously held charge of the risk monitoring department he has also worked as the banking ombudsman new delhi he has also worked in central offices of foreign exchange department and department of banking regulation as well as in the reserve bank's regional offices at ahmedabad hyderabad chennai and new delhi sri rajeshwar rao has a bachelor of arts in economics and a master in business administration from university of cochin he is also a certified associate of indian institute of bankers from iibf thank you sir and i welcome you to that as
evening, everybody. Mr. Dinesh Khara, Chairman, State Bank of India. Mr. Bishwaketan Das, Chief Executive Officer of IIBF, Managing Director, State Bank of India. Distinguished, distinguished members of the banking fraternity, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed an honor and a privilege to deliver the 12th Memorial Lecture honoring the great legacy of Sri R.K. Talwar. Particularly so, given that this is his birth centenary and also the 75th year of India's Platinum Jubilee of India's independence. I feel thankful and humbled for this opportunity as an occasion to remember a personality like Sri Talwar, given his contribution to the banking industry. India has recently celebrated 75 years of its independence. And during this period, our country has witnessed a transition to a promising and prominent force in the new global order. However, the journey is far from complete and a lot remains to be accomplished to realize our true potential. Such occasions as these gives us an occasion, opportunity to reflect on the path traversed, the continuing and emerging challenges and the way ahead. Sri Talwar took the helm at India's largest bank at a very pivotal point in our banking history, the period of nationalization. He reoriented the commercial banking to serve the underprivileged, which aligned seamlessly with the objectives of nationalization. His emphasis on innovative banking, rehabilitation of sick units, convenient and accessible financing to small-scale industries, and credit impetus for rural development are testaments to his vision, which later became the cornerstone of responsible banking, paving way for in inclusive development in our country. Since independence, our country has taken giant strides in growth and development in all the sectors. The gross domestic product of India rose from about rupees 5 lakh crores in 1950-51 to about 147 lakh crores in 2021 at constant prices of 2011-2012, growing about 27 times with a compounded average annual growth rate of about 4.8%. But in the shadow of this growth story lies a duality which attracts the attention of every policymaker and the concerned citizens. Even at the GDP has grown 27-fold in the last seven decades. The per capita income has grown merely seven-fold from rupees 14,000 in 1950-51 to about rupees 1 lakh in 2021 at constant prices for 2011-12. That's with a compounded average growth rate of 2.9%. This duality highlights the importance and requirement of inclusive growth of our country, a goal we should all aspire for and contribute towards in our respective professional capacities. The evolution of the financial system too has been dotted with several twists and turns reflecting the policy choices made in a given socio-economic and political context. As is generally said, policy making is not amenable to corner solutions. The outcomes more often than not lie somewhere in the hazy middle reflecting the contextual trade-offs. In my remarks today, I intend to dwell on some of these trade-offs, the idea being not to judge them for their existence or to contemplate about the counterfactuals, but just to bring forth the specific structural paths our financial system has journeyed over the course of the last seven decades while bolstering the evolving, ever-evolving Indian growth story. I will therefore briefly touch on some of the structural regulatory dualities of the Indian financial system, which are integral to addressing some of the key questions which I highlight while venturing with a few thoughts of my own on the way ahead. If you look at it, Mr. Talwar joined the bank, uh, took over as chairman of State Bank of India at the cusp of first of the three major policy changes which we have witnessed in the last five decades or so. This was the nationalization of the financial services. These were subsequently followed by two others, that is the liberalization in the financial services in the 90s and maybe the digitalization of the financial services in the last five to seven years. So these policy changes have been driven by government and regulatory policies 
and the uh, what do you call the outcomes of these policies have actually thrown up several issues which are evolving and may be continuing to evolve for some more times to come and i thought i would flag these issues primarily to have this issue to be thought on debated and perhaps studied in the times to come now the first question is bank led versus market led financial intermediation in india now question is is it possible to envision envision a transition from a bank dominated financial system to a non bank intermediation channel there is extensive empirical ed- evidence and literature which substantiates the claim that economic development of a country is closely associated with the development of the financial system which creates an efficient system of pooling the savings and channelizing them to productive capacities of the country while bank credit has historically been a dominant source of financing in india the same has been supplemented over the period by non bank channels which have grown significantly in the last one decade or so india now has more than 10 crore dmat accounts and there has been a spurt in entities accessing the primary markets to raise funds relatively newer entrants in this game the mutual funds have clocked assets under management of around rupees 40 lakh crores the corporate bond markets too have grown significantly though structurally it remains confined to better rated corporates with expected penetration down the credit curve remaining an enduring challenge there has been a steady increase in the corporate bond issuances and the outstanding amounts have crossed rupees 40 lakh crores as of march 2022 as we all know corporate bond markets act as risk diffusers within the financial system redistributing the risk among a larger set of investors while the gradual shift in the flow of credit from banks to market based mechanisms has been evident the road has been longer in our case as we still see the centrality of the banks in the economic system ironically the banks have also been supporting several market segments of the non bank intermediation channel as providers of secondary market liquidity for credit enhancement and as market makers this makes the job of reserve bank as a regulator even more critical because of the interconnectedness of all the economic agents with the banking system the government the sebi and the reserve bank have taken several steps to develop the corporate bond market sebi has put in place a market microstructure for corporate bonds in the form of dvp settlement electronic bidding platform and reporting of trades to increase transparency in pricing reserve bank has also endeavored to develop complementary markets such as the repo and the cds to supplement the efforts of sebi we firmly believe that with the growing need for credit the sources of credit would also need diversification this would enable a competitive pricing of credit risk among the market participants and give more bargaining power to the companies looking to fund their growth and expansion and thus would be beneficial to the real sector however let me emphasize that over the years there is one key aspect in which the role of banks has become more and not less important inclusiveness of intermediation both geographic and demographic the banking sector has over the years borne much of the burden in this regard absorbing a lot of costs in the process any assessment of the performance of the banking system vis-a-vis the other channels must not lose sight of this critical aspect the second issue is the often ongoing debate of public versus private banks does there exist a middle ground in the debate indian banking system has a very distinguishing characteristic pre and post liberalization before liberalization indian economy was largely a mixed economy with the government playing a dominant economic role for planned development this economic structure was well aligned with the contemporaneous banking structure where the public sector banks own roughly 90% of the total banking assets in india especially after the two major episodes of nationalization of banks in 1969 and 1980 the genesis of financial sector reforms in india 
could be attributed to the recommendations of the Committee on Financial System, chaired by Sri M. Narsimham in 1991, which is more popularly known as the Narsimham Committee 1. Based on the recommendations of this committee, dual regulation of Reserve Bank was proposed to be removed, interest rates were largely deregulated, statutory liquidity ratio and cash reserve ratios were reduced to increase the productive capacity of the bank capital and more importantly the banking sector started to get reorganized with the entry of private sector and foreign banks. The idea of introducing new banks was to improve competitiveness of the banking system for better allocative efficiency. Since the commencement of their business the new age private sector banks have been contributing increasingly to the credit needs of the economy. In the last 25 years, their share in the total credit has increased from about 3% in 1996-97 to about 36% in 2021-22. While the private banks have had their share of problems, their presence has made the financial system more resilient and has provided impetus to the efforts of financial deepening in the form of accelerated growth in bank credit to the GDP uh, and the bank credit to GDP ratio has increased from 26.7% in 95 to about 52% in 2021. As regards the public sector banks, their role has been extensively debated over the years. The idea of banking consolidation was first pitched in the Narsimhan Committee 1 through establishment of a three-tier banking structure. First, having three large banks with international presence, two, having eight to ten banks with the national presence, pan-India presence, and third, a larger number of regional and local banks. It is argued that large consolidated banks may potentially have better risk diversification due to economies of scale and capacity to finance large projects. The latter rationale for consolidation becomes more pertinent as Indian firms and their concomitant credit requirements grow. Government of India has been facilitating consolidation of the public sector banks in India over the past few years. As a result, the number of public sector banks has got reduced from 27 as of March 2017 to about 12 as at the end of June 2022. The number of private sector banks has remained constant at 21 during the same period. The consolidation of public sector banks does not seem to have had any negative impact on their outreach or the inclusive banking efforts as the total number of bank branches has re largely remained the same with minor reductions due to rationalization both pre and post merger. Besides, the financial inclusion efforts have already transcended to a business correspondent led model leveraging on technology. At a broader level for enabling reasonable pl level playing field there would have to be gradual convergence in terms of operating space and flexibility available to each class of entity. In terms of regulatory and prudential norms governing the public and private sector banking operations, there is also already a significant degree of convergence. Therefore, from a prudential perspective, the debate is infructuous. However, the same level of convergence would have to be extended to managerial and operational flexibility of PSBs based on certain governance standards. Going forward, this would generate the requisite space for both private sec public sector banks as well as private banks to grow their business and thrive. Another issue is the business models. Do we have diversified or a specialized bank? Do, is there a space for a niche banking in this entire setup? With widespread digital revolution and massive penetration of internet in the Indian households, the need for aligning banking practices of 21st century with new aspirations of India was felt. Based on this evolving scenario, a committee under the chairmanship of Dr. Nachiket Moore, the then member of the Central Board of Reserve Bank, was constituted to study the scope of fina comprehensive financial services to small businesses and low-income households. The committee submitted its report in 2013 and discussed the idea of differentiated banking in India on the basis of horizontal and vertical differentiation involving formation of separate stylized banks on the basis of regional 
or sectoral scope and activities based deposits or transactions or credit. The concept of payment banks was first discussed in that report which started the formal discourse on differentiated banking. Subsequently, the Union Finance Minister announced in the 2014-15 budget that Reserve Bank would create a framework for licensing small finance banks and other differentiated banks. In accordance with this announcement, the Reserve Bank issued guidelines for setting up of small finance banks and payment banks in November 2014. The specified objectives of setting up small finance banks as envisaged in the, these licensing guidelines is to further financial inclusion by one provision of savings vehicles, two supply of credit to small business units, small and marginal farmers, micro and small industries and other unorganized entities through high technology low cost operations. On similar lines, payment banks were set up with the objective to further financial inclusion by providing one small savings accounts and two payment remittance services to migrant labor force workforce, lower income households, small businesses and other unorganized sector entities as well as other users. Since their inception, the small finance banks have started playing a progressive role in mobilizing savings from and providing credit to the initial customer segments, furthering the cause of financial inclusion. The growth of aggregate deposits and credits of SFBs have been significant since March 2018. In the quarter ended March 2022, the deposits grew by 37% on a year-on-year -year basis, while the growth in credit portfolio was 25.6% as against the growth rate of deposits and credits of scheduled commercial banks at 10%, 10.2% and 10.8% respectively. Although it may seem unfair to compare the concerned numbers of public and private sector banks to the SFBs because of the scale effects, even in terms of outreach through bank branches, SFBs represent about 4% of the branch bank network in India currently, expanding from less than 1% in 2017. Payment banks in India are truly the first generation new age differentiated bank designed on activity based functional differentiation. The impact of these banks on the digital payment economy and doorstep banking cannot be assessed just by their point of presence but also by the data of facilitated digital transactions. Just to give a perspective on this, the payment banks facilitated a total of about 11.4 crore mobile banking transactions, amounting to 17,465 crores of rupees in value in the month of June 2020. This has increased to 47.3 crore transactions with an aggregate value of rupees 46,338 crores in just two years this is the data as at the end of August 2022, growing by 4.1 times in terms of volume and 2.7 times in terms of value. It is also important to highlight that as of August 2022, there were 2.5 crore active users of payment banks using their mobile banking facilities, representing about 2.7% of all active internet users in India. The primary objective of differentiated banking structure, as alluded to earlier, was to expand the reach of financial services and institutions with financial inclusion being the overarching objective. Therefore, the underlying premise of differentiated banking institutions is based on differentiated reach. As we are all experiencing now, almost all the banks have or are in the process of adopting technology to improve and expand delivery of financial services and products. The Reserve Bank has been taking progressive measures <coughs> to improve the availability of digital infrastructure for banking services and this process got a significant boost recently with the launch of 75 digital banking units by the Honorable Prime Minister. <coughs> the digital banking units will be set up in to 75 districts to commemorate the 75 years of independence under the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav for a targeted digital banking drive. The DBUs would facilitate customers in embarking the digital journey through digital modes and channels in a paperless, efficient, safe and secure environment, enhance financial inclusion 
and make available the full array of financial products to the public in a seamless and efficient manner and enhance their banking experience. The DBUs would also help in creating awareness on the various aspects of digital banking, lessening the hesitation among the customers towards availing digital financial service and catalyze and thereby enable the faster adoption of digitization. Establishment of the DBU is a noteworthy step to augment the digital infrastructure for banking services in the country and facilitate a seamless banking experience. Given the scope to scale up the financialization of the Indian economy and accelerate the pace of financial inclusion, there exists enough space for differentiated financial institutions to operate and grow. At the same time, it needs to be ensured that the business models have to be sufficiently robust to provide the required financial resilience and good governance and technological standards are adhered to while striving to fulfill their desired objectives. A fifth issue in my view is the choice, I mean the balancing between innovation and customer protection. Technology enabled innovation in financial services has been one of the greatest disruptors to the traditional way of banking. Alternate models of lending are rapidly changing the market dynamics and affecting the role of traditional intermediaries. While the banks have access to low-cost deposits, the tech firm's advantage is that with technology aid, they can utilize a range of data and alternate inputs to evaluate creditworthiness of, who, of whom to lend to. From a regulatory standpoint, while there are strong arguments for making sure that the traditional vehicles of lending continue, there is a view that re re regulators are often reluctant to encourage fintech-led innovations and this approach is perceived to unfairly skew the balance in favor of the banks. To my mind, this would not be the right inference. Technological changes need to be imbibed in digestible doses to forestall destabilizing of financial systems. No doubt, growth of techno technology-led innovations needs to be fostered. But preserving financial system stability is an overriding objective for the regulators and achieving the right mix of ensuring stability while fostering innovation remains the goal. Therefore, the regulators expect the nature of partnerships between the traditional banks and new fintech players to evolve into a symbiotic one and not necessarily an adversarial one. This could create a win-win outcome for all the stakeholders. But one challenge that may arise is that of proxy disintermediation with attendant risks of financial activities taking place outside the regulatory perimeter. The recent guidelines on digital lending is an attempt to have an enabling framework balancing these competing considerations. Most of the innovations in the delivery of financial services have an inherent aspect of conduct. The choice between exploitative and resp versus responsible conduct. It is important to establish a common denominator of what is responsible. This dimension has a lot of subjectivity while seeking to address this issue. Ethical and responsible banking, being sensitive to the needs of the people that we are serving, being inclusive in our approach to vulnerable sections of society, taking prudent financial decisions, these are all choices which are always available to each one of us engaged in the financial sector. Banking fraternity, being the trust bearer of the society, owes it to the people and the country to be sensitive, inclusive, responsible and prudent. Our financial institutions have navigated and will continue to navigate through these choices. Adopting unfair means, oblivious of the consequences, may push the top line in the short run but will potentially harm the organization over the long run. After all, financial institutions are not in the business for a few years, but for a long haul. Hence, from a purely business point of view, it would make a lot of sense to act in the interests of all the stakeholders. All aspects, affordability, accessibility, and especially the appropriateness should therefore be adhered to whenever we design a financial product or deliver it. Breaching any of the above cannot be a choice at all for us in the financial service industry. 
I have earlier just tried to briefly highlight the critical dualities of the Indian financial system. As I mentioned earlier, I do not intend to judge any of these categories. The only intention is to bring forth these dualities is to emphasize the largely organic evolution of the Indian financial system in response to our growing economy and highlight that the regulatory frameworks of the RBI have facilitated meeting these ever-changing needs of the country. At every juncture of growth in the financial system, at every kink, there are innumerable policy choices for a regulator. The decisions we make today have the potential to shape the future of our economy and our nation. But sometimes we wonder whether, on whether what would have been the counterfactual and answer, answering such a counterfactual is quite difficult. But it can be most certainly stated that the depth, size and resilience of the Indian financial system owes much to the decisions in the past taken at these various crossroads. One way well argue that these policy choices were not necessarily proactive but may be reactive as well. True, central banks do not have the liberty to innovate freely and we have to put our mandate and financial stability at the forefront. There have been times when we have appreciated for our prudent policies and at times we are criticized for being conservative. But let me assure you, whatever we do, we strive to do in broader public interest. Every policy stance of ours is customized to the need of our economy and preserving financial stability, which remains our guiding principle. In a conventional setup, the banking regulation has some pre-specified toolkits, which are time-tested and are adopted globally. Every financial crisis offers some insights to the regulators and the toolkits are accordingly modified in response to the lessons learned. But with a dynamically evolving financial system. Regulators do not have the liberty to rely excess, as excessively on existing means because many of the potential challenges which are emanating from the emerging financial order are not foreseeable. Worldwide, regulators are striving to remain ahead of the curve, but they simply cannot afford to be reactive because they cannot simply afford to be reactive in this environment. The changes we feel to be insignificant today can grow manifold in a very short span of time, posing threat to the stability of the financial system. Therefore, we have to be cognizant of all the financial changes happening around and respond appropriately to such changes. As the regulatory perimeter gradually extends into uncharted domains, climate finance, regulation of digital lending, etc., some of these issues will become even more relevant. To guide us in this transition, we have tried to fix some broad principles that make the policy stance adaptive enough to cope with any present and future challenges while creating an enabling environment for innovations with positive external externalities. At a broad level, three guiding principles that would be helpful in framing financial regulation going ahead are one, being principle-based, being proportionate to the degree of risk, and also focus on activity-based regulations. In an uncertain business environment, it is very difficult to predict and then prescribe all possible scenarios of a financial transaction. Therefore, such complex superstructure warrants that the regulator should move away from a rule-based prescriptive regime to a principle-based regime and the principles of regulation should always have the financial stability and interests of the consumers at its core. The second principle for present and future regulation should be a differentiated regulatory system based on size, complexity and contribution to systemic risk. Further, as interconnectedness, scope of activities and harmonization of financial intermediation increases, entity-based regulatory architecture may create arbitrage between different entities undertaking similar activity. Therefore, going forward, activity should form a common regulatory thought for future regulations. So given these evolving changes, what I feel the regulated entities need to do is have prudence in conduct and have a robust risk management system, ensure ethical conduct of business, ensure the centrality of the customers, effect, have an effective grievance redressal mechanism, while from the regulator's perspective, the need is to have responsive and responsible regulation focused 
which will ensure financial stability while furthering the goals of financial inclusion and facilitating the growth. Let me end by citing a few lines from the well-known poem by Robert Frost, which not only resonates with what I just said, but also touches upon the theme of this lecture, reflections on policy choices. The two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you to, once again to the IIBA for organizing this lecture and giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts. And thank you all, distinguished guests, for your patient listening. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, sir, for a very enriching speech. The floor is now open for a brief question answer session. No, I think the one thing which can be noted is the credit to GDP ratio in most of the advanced economies is well over 100 percent. To that extent, India is rel relatively under financialized in the sense the finance ratio is about 50 to 52 percent is not very robust. But it essentially indicates the ability or the space for us to grow our financial services going forward. And that could actually help in increasing the growth rate of our economy also. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I had what, one more question. Uh, abroad, uh, there is a credit enhancement mechanism. That is, if uh, somebody's credit rating is low, he can get the credit uh, enhanced by taking a guarantee from an insurance company. Now, is there any possibility of such a system coming into India? I think uh, we do not really prescribe specific products, specific guidelines. As I said, we are focusing larger on board principles and things to follow. So if there is a product which can be done for enhancing of credit, I don't really see anything objectionable at this point. It can be considered. But only thing is it should not either impinge on the banks stability or maybe compromise on the customer's uh, interest. These are the two, I think, overriding principles which we would focus on as far as the new products are concerned. You will not rule out this possibility? Yeah. Hmm? CDS is there. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kuldeep Kumar. Uh, sir, thank you very much uh, uh, for this enriching lecture. Uh, one thing, uh, uh, we are seeing lot many large number of collaborations between uh, fintech, tech fin, banks and regulated entities these days. So on the policy front, uh, could you please enlighten us? Uh, what are the views of the Reserve Bank of India? with regard to the data security issues related to these transactions? No, as far as uh, this issue is concerned, the inter, inter interaction between the tech and the financial entities, well, we had a working group looking into this issue, the working group on digital lending. They had come out with several recommendations and those recommendations have been rolled out for implementation by us sometime in September. So that, uh, I mean, end of August, I think. So that essentially articulates the approach. Largely, one, there should be a proper agreement between the end lending agency and the tech firm which is offering the services. We, I would, I was specifically mentioning it in the context of the, what do you call the problems which we have faced regarding the digital lending apps. So what kind of agreement should be there? What kind of safeguards are required for the customers to ensure protection of the customers? What kind of standards will require to be adhered to by these lending apps. 
then there is a fundamental issue of data security and data privacy which is actually something which needs to be looked at very seriously by all the banks and others because many of the apps need not necessarily be something which is generated here it could be from an off-site center it could have threat in terms of the way they can actually hack your data for other purposes so we need to be very careful and cognizant of this we the committee has recommended having an agency a digital which will actually look at setting standards for this and also maybe prescribing data privacy data security standards so we will be working on that that is something which is likely to take some time and I think we'll have to have a collaborative effort to take this issue forward. Sir, uh, yeah. sir good evening, sir. Uh, my, I am Ravi Gupta. My question to you is that uh, currently a lot of focus is on environmental or climatic change uh, worldwide. And uh, huge focus is on sustainable finance. So I... With my own experience, I can say that RBI is one of the finest regulators. And uh, my question to you is that as a regulator, what will be your approach for regulating sustainable finance in support for the banks or the financial institutions? As also, how the regulator will uh, have uh, the role played for the economic development in terms of sustainability of the economic development as well as for the banks. I think uh, climate finance is an evolving area and I think uh, as of now there are several strands of work which are going to look at these issues in terms of creating a taxonomy of sustainable uh, green, re green finance related issues, a reporting framework, then what kind of principles for regulating the climate financing, the risks from climate finance. So there is several strands of work which are going on at an international level which will essentially ensure a harmonized approach on this particular issue which is I think very fundamentally relevant for all of us. After all this is only one planet we have. So we have to ensure a, I mean survival, surviving and our survival and the sustainability of whatever we do in terms of economic activity. So that is one part. From the Reserve Bank perspective, yes, uh, we have tried to flag some of these issues through a discussion paper which we have put out in public domain, which essentially focuses on a l various dimensions in terms of the risk assessment, governance structures to assess climate finance, what kind of disclosures will have to be done. But many of these issues will need development based on whatever have been the evolving changes in the taxonomy, reporting, etc., which will come from the international standard setting bodies. The international standard setting bodies also looking at some accounting, what do you call, proposals for reporting of such activities, because that will ensure that the financing for these entities, especially through the investment route, can come through with some kind of uh, assurance as to the disclosures with these entities are making. So all in all, the core point which I would like to make is there is a lot of work going on which is actually feeding into this. And I think in the coming G20 where India is actually taking over as the president of G20, climate finance finds a very prominent spot. And I think that will be addressed during the course of this presidency. And depending from the Reserve Bank's perspective, depending on the responses to the our discussion paper as well as maybe the developments which take place at the international fora, we could come out with the guidelines for the regulated entities shortly. or developed financial markets as compared to rule-based uh, uh, financial, rule-based regulations. Uh, so my question to you, sir, that uh, do you think uh, principle-based regulation uh, is, is better in comparison to rule-based rule regulations? And if you think so, that do you think that the Indian financial system and the regulators are ready to migrate uh, towards a principle-based regulation? Anyway, that's a very tricky question, to be honest. Anyway, I would... Uh, 
See, I think uh, we have to make the transition from a rule based to a principle. I think that is something which we are trying to consciously do. But depending on the level of maturity of the financial system, maybe there is scope for having some kind of rule based approaches in certain areas while focusing on maybe principle based approaches in the other areas. And even the principle based, like if you look at uh, maybe in the past, you had the prudential regulatory authority and think the, uh, the FCA, no? it was a predecessor over there. I think uh, FSA, financial FSA. supervision, FSA. yeah, financial. They used to have the principle-based regulations, but the clarifications on those principle-based regulations used to be about a 8,000-page manual. That's what I was told. So, I mean, uh, jury's still out on that, but I think we will try to evolve to it. But uh, I think that it depends on the level of maturity and the level issue on which maybe we'll have to look at making the regulation. I think I can stop there. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We now come to another important part of the event. This year is the birth centenary of Sri Rajkumar Talwar. And to commemorate the centenary celebrations of Sri Rajkumar Talwar, IIBF has compiled the speeches of this memorial lecture delivered by renowned dignitaries from 2007 to 2021. To help us formally launch the book, May I request Mr. Karan Talwar, member of Talwar family, to kindly accompany the dignitaries on stage for the formal launch of the book. And I also request the MDs, Mr. Ashwini Kumar Tiwari, Mr. Alok Chaudhary, Mr. C.S. Shetty, and Mr. J. Swaminathan to kindly join the dignitaries on stage for the formal launch of the book. A few words of, about Mr. Karan Talwar, member of the Talwar family. Mr. Karan Talwar is Mr. Rajkumar Talwar's grandson. Born in Pondicherry while his grandparents resided there, he grew up in Hyderabad. He is a gold medalist from Nalsar University of Law and has worked in premier law firms, law firms in New Delhi and Hyderabad in the past and now runs his own law firm in Hyderabad under the name Karan Talwar and Associates. He specializes in tax and corporate litigation and advisory and regularly appears before various judicial fora. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. We now come to the end of the event and I request Dr. S. Burlidharan Director of Academics, IABF, to sum up Karan and... Will you speak something now? Ah, okay. Sorry. Mr. Talwar. Uh, sorry. Mr. Talwar. A few words from Mr. Karan Talwar before we finally uh, propose the vote of thanks. It's a, it's a matter of great pride for our family uh, and I can say that my grandfather has been a role model for all of us in the family, for his achievements and the kind of person that he was. You all know, of course, the professional side of him, his contributions to Indian banking, his value-based leadership, his strength of character, his integrity. And we all felt in the family that if we could even be half of what he was, we would have achieved something significant in life. 
as I have read about him, uh, the youngest uh, chairman of the State Bank of India, uh, so much that he has done, of course, for Indian banking. But when he demitted office in 1976, as some of you would know, he went through tough times. Uh, but still, uh, he was such a happy individual. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say that he was a fountain of love and compassion to all of us and to all that he met. Uh, it was truly incredible. And if I can only share two mantras that he shared with me as I was growing up, and I look at this as the culmination of perhaps the crystallized wisdom that he had uh, over the years, you know, before he crossed over in 2002. He would tell me one, never kid yourself. He always believed in that and I believe that he used this as a mantra to keep growing as a person. And ultimately, of course, uh, when he moved uh, after retirement to Pondicherry, he used that as a mantra for his spiritual growth. And the second thing that I think he taught all of us in our family, which is very, very basic, but it's so true, was discipline. Nothing can be achieved without discipline. So I thought I would just share from the prism of a grandson's eyes that this is what uh, he was uh, from the personal side. I thank everyone at IIBF and SBI for remembering him till this day, 48 years after retirement, to still be spoken of, studied in banking circles, case studies on him. Uh, I, I can only say as I am overwhelmed with emotion, uh, thank you. Respected dignitaries on the dais, Mr. M. Rajeshwar Rao, Deputy Governor Reserve Bank of India, Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara, Chairman State Bank of India and President of IABF, Mr. Biswaketan Das, CEO of IABF, Mr. Karan Talwar, MDs of State Bank of India and ladies and gentlemen. We were indeed fortunate to have Mr. Rajeshwar Rao as the distinguished speaker on this important occasion. A speech on the topic reflection on policy choices in the Indian financial system, all of you will agree, was indeed a truly rewarding experience. The Deputy Governor briefly touched upon some of the structural and regulatory dualities of the Indian financial system, which are integral to addressing some of the key questions. These included the bank-led versus market-led financial intermediation in India, ownership, the debate on public versus private, business models diversified versus specialized and innovation and customer innovation customer protection in his concluding remarks the deputy governor mentioned that the depth size and resilience of the indian financial system owes much to the decisions taken in the past at various crossroads every policy stance of the reserve bank of india has been customized to the need of a growing economy and preserving financial stability and the, that remains the guiding principle of the regulator of the banking system, the Reserve Bank of India. He mentioned that one has to be cognizant of the, all the financial changes happening around and respond appropriately to such changes. At a broad level, the Deputy Governor mentioned three guiding principles that would be helpful in framing the financial regulation going ahead are principle-based, proportionate and activity-based regulations. The present and future regulations should be a differentiated regulatory system based on size, complexity, and contribution to systemic risk. Sir, we are indeed thankful to you for an enlightening speech, which had many learning points. We also thank Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara, State Bank of India, and President of IAPF for sparing his valuable time and sharing his insights on the topic. And on this important and prestigious occasion, which happens to be the birth centenary of the legendary Sri R.K. Talwar, the book having the rich compilation of all the speeches given by eminent personalities over the years was launched. It was indeed a very joyful moment. We are thankful to Mr. Karan Talwar and to the MDs of State Bank of India and also to the, all the participants for attending the lecture. And last but not the least, a word of thanks for the officers of State Bank of India for providing excellent support as usual. We thank you for being with us this evening. It has indeed been a real pleasure. 
we all request you to join for high tea thank you and a happy diwali to all